Hopefully that's not soon, but I do love that song. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to pull those out, and we're going to jump in the Word here in a moment. I do want to remind you that our, all of our kiddos are in here today on a holiday weekend. We keep our kiddos in here, and so grateful to have all of them, and uh, they can pull out, you can pull out your children's bulletin and go along as we go along, and, and uh, we have been in a series entitled uh, 24, and uh, next week we're going to press pause on that series as we have what we're calling our First Fruit Sunday, and, and we want every member at Homewood uh, to be here next week. Uh, it's going to be a great day, uh, not just because we are given the first fruit offerings of our Fuel the Vision campaign, uh, but also that we want to put our faith forward and say, you know what, we, we want to give our first fruits in making this time a priority. Uh, I know things come up in life and vacations happen and sicknesses happen and kids happen and all that kind of stuff, but but there is, a, there is a significant thing that the Spirit does when we gather as His people each and every week. And so next week, we want to give the first fruits of our worship to God as well. So I want to encourage you, if you are uh, in town, make sure that you are here next week. If you're out of town, make sure you join us live stream. We want as many folks to be a part of next Sunday as possible. And if any of our kiddos, if you've been collecting in your piggy banks uh, for the coin drive next week you're you are going to bring those forward and our, our kids are going to lead the way in offering our first fruits next week and so i want to encourage you to continue to pack those up we've we've been packing ours full of of stuff this past few weeks and so uh, i want to encourage you to, to be a part of that if you're one of our kiddos uh, this series 24 is one that was really birthed inside of me last year and it just began developing and and we started in Luke chapter 24. We call the series 24 because there's 24 chapters in the book of Luke. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to be turning to Luke chapter 21. We are actually working our way backwards because we started with the end in mind. And that's why the empty tomb is still on the stage. Uh, some folks think this, this is just a symbol or, or something that you use on Easter. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're focusing on the empty tomb every week because because that's where we find our hope. That's where we find uh, our promise of, of life eternal. And so we, we, we begin with the end in mind. And I've, I've often found in my own life, if I begin with the end in mind, the, the journey has a little more purpose. It has a little more significance. It has a little more um, a weight to it because uh, we, we, we kind of know how the story ends. And as God's people, as, as believers in Christ, we know how the story ends. And so that's why we started in Luke 24. Because we know that the resurrection power exists. And we know that that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives within each one of us, Paul says in Ephesians. That we have that same resurrection power inside of us. And so my question to you today is, are you living like it? Are you living like it? Do you, do you live like a, a new creation? Do you, do, do you live like someone who has that same power that, that took a man and, and brought him up out of the grave? Do you, do you live with that same power inside of you? And so in Luke chapter 21, as we continue this journey backwards, we, we start off and we see this story of the widow's might. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. And, and I, I love this story because you can imagine the disciples sitting around and you can imagine Jesus walking with them into the temple. And one of his last acts of a public ministry is that he watches people give. He watches people give. And you, you say, Jesus, you could have, you could have so done so much better than, than that being one of your last acts of public ministry. I mean, you could have, you could have been healing the sick. You could have been out giving and administering to the poor. You could have done so much better, but you chose to sit and watch people give. But this is what Jesus does. He sits and he, he watches people give. And we said a few weeks ago that other writings tell us that there's like these 13, you know, big, big drums of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the temple and people come and they throw their money and, and, and the rich folk had, had really recognized how they could how could they make their their giving more noticeable and they knew how to throw the throw the money in there 
And so they would make this loud sound, and everybody would hear, and they'd throw it in there and go, clank, 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 clank. Everybody go, wow, that person gave a lot of money. Wow. And then this widow comes in. I don't know, she may have been older than this lady depicted on the screen. She may have been younger, I don't know, but she comes in. And she throws in a couple coins worth maybe five minutes of work. And the only person in the room that hears it, ping, ping, is Jesus. And Jesus says, hey guys, guys, did you hear this? Did you, did you hear this? Come here, listen. This woman gave. And, and where we measure amount, Jesus measures heart. Jesus measures faith. Jesus measures these things. And, and so we see this picture, and right after this happens is where our story picks up today. In Luke 21, starting in verse 5. Now, I want you to imagine what's going on. They have just left this scene. They have just walked out of the temple. They had just, the disciples had just seen Jesus make this illustration, this point of this widow that gives everything that she has. And, and here's what they say. Some of his disciples were remarking about, about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. And can, can you just confess that we do that? Have you, have you ever been visiting somewhere? Maybe you're visiting here today, I don't know, but have you ever been visiting somewhere else? You may not do it as much here, but when you go somewhere else and you're, you're walking out and say, man, that was, a, that was a great facility, wasn't it? Did you, notice how, did you notice how beautiful that facility was? That was a great facility. Facility. We love the word facility. It was a great facility. Did you notice, did you notice their welcome area? It was awesome. Did, 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 you, did you notice, how, did you notice how, what they did with the children's area? It was so cool. And, and we, we do this, don't we? Isn't this kind of wired inside of us? That's, that's, how, we, that's how we think sometimes and measure. And is there anything inherently wrong with that acknowledgement? No, but, but I love Jesus. I love how Jesus kind of takes our attention and he redirects it. He brings it back to, to the important. He, he brings it back to the end in mind so often, doesn't he? And even when we don't want him to, even like when we would rather talk about our facility, he brings it back. Now, the cool thing is, is you know, through, through our fuel of vision, there, there's going to be some, some restoration of this facility. But it's, it's never the, the end. If the goal were for us to walk out and say, look at this facility, what a pitiful goal that would be. I'm excited about some of the changes that are going to be taking place. And we'll have more opportunity to, to harvest community in this place and relationships and places where we can meet and gather. And what a blessing that is. But I love how Jesus redirects. He, he redirects the attention. Look in verse 6, where Jesus says, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them, Jesus says, will be thrown down. Now, the temple had this, this air of indestructibility in it. And, and when one looks at a, a powerful nation, it's easy to think that it will exist forever. At the, at the height of the Roman Empire, nobody imagined that one day the Roman Empire would only exist in history books. Nobody ever imagined that at the height of it. And, and here's a reminder. If you've fallen asleep, I want you to wake up. Because here's a reminder, church. For me and for all of us. And I want to say this very carefully because I love our country. And on this Memorial Day weekend, let us honor the men and women who have sacrificed for our freedoms. 
Many in this room have paid a great price. Several of you are paying a great price now as your family members serve to protect our freedoms. I was on the phone this past week with folks and friends of mine, and, and my brother was one of them who who's served, and just thanking them for the way they have served our country. I, I had the opportunity to pay for a meal for some of our servicemen and women uh, just a couple weeks ago. And I'm so grateful for their service. But catch this. May we remember that our eternal freedom, may we remember that our eternal freedom is not found in a country. Our eternal freedom is found in an empty tomb. May we keep the end in mind. May we remember that our eternal freedom is found in a risen Savior. And that that's what we celebrate. And that that is where we find our identity. And that's who we are. So disciples, they, they make this comment that not one stone will be left on another. And with these words, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you can still see these stones laying on the ground and uh, there's actually a, a trip to Israel that is being planned and if you're interested in that there'll be a meeting next week immediately following our service but if you went over to Jerusalem today you would see these stones from the temple still laying there on the ground you would be able to see that and a lot of us hear this this phrase this words of Jesus and we don't get it I mean we don't really understand it if you're like me it just kind of passes over you. The temple will be destroyed. Okay, that's great. But if we understand the gravity of what Jesus is saying here, it would be like someone coming in this room today. And we got the kiddos in here, so I don't want to scare any of them. But this would be like someone coming in this room today and standing up here and saying, Disney World is a going to be destroyed. Disney World is going now most of you perked up right there because you you maybe have a trip plan or you've been there before and, and so you perked up what excuse me you know Disney World what Disney World what 60,000 employees a billion dollars in payroll every year millions of people go to this place if someone came into our little world today and said Disney World is going to be destroyed I guarantee you some folks would be perking up a little bit. And this is like the gravity of the comment of what Jesus made when he said the temple is going to be destroyed. That's how serious it was. It's like someone saying the White House is going to be destroyed. The Washington Mon Monument is going to be destroyed. And we would think, what? No! No! And with this comment Jesus once again redirects our attention keep going with me in your Bibles in verse 7 teacher they asked when will these things happen the disciples are curious now okay when when are these things going to happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place he replied watch out that you are not deceived for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near do not follow them Jesus said and what he does is he, he virtually avoided their question and instead of telling them what they wanted to know he told them what they needed to know and that is how to conduct themselves in light of the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming and so in your notes there's going to be a few things if you want to jot these down in a few lines you have in there but may we as God's people remember this warning from Jesus, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Deception is not new. It's been around for a long, long time. It even dates back to the, the, the Garden of Eden when Satan, Satan the great deceiver, how does he do it? How does the enemy do it? He, I'm going to give you three words that start with the letter D so you can remember them. He disputes God's word. What did he say in Genesis 3, chapter 1? What did he say? He said, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He disputes God's word. 
But he doesn't just dispute God's word, he also denies it. He disputes God's word and he denies God's word. What did he go on to say in Genesis? The enemy said this in verse 4 of chapter 3, you will not surely die. He disputes it, he denies God's word, and he displaces God's word. Satan says in verse 5, for God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And one of the easiest ways for us to see deception at at work is in our culture today and how we respond to sin. So do not be deceived. Verse 9, he keeps on going and says this, when, when you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. Now, if, if I'm the disciples, I'm listening to this, and, and, and we're thinking all on, on the account of your name, so, so we're going to be believing in your name, so we're, we're going to be trusting in your name, because what I'm hearing is, is that none of this really is, is about my name, so if I just kind of step back and, and stop associating with your name, then things will go well. In verse 13 Jesus continues, he says, this will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Pretty encouraging stuff. All men will hate you because of me. Sign me up. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. Jesus says, do not be afraid. Do you realize that the most frequent command in the Bible, it's not don't lie, It's not help the poor. It's not love your neighbor. Those are are all very important things, but the most frequent command in the Bible is fear not. Do not be afraid. We read that over and over and over again in Scripture. Fear not. As Ben talked about just a few moments ago during communion, that when we focus on fear, we take our focus off the one who said, fear not. Did you catch that? When we focus on fear, we take our focus off of the one who said, fear not. And so I love these words from David in Psalm chapter 56. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. I'm convinced that somebody in this room needed to hear that this morning. That something is going on in your life right now where you needed to hear that. Something is going on in your job. Something is going on in your kid's life. Something is going on in your family. Something is going on in your life right now where you needed to hear that. So I want to ask you to repeat that phrase. Say, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. One more time. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Do you believe it? Do you believe in faith over fear? I love what he says in verse 13 in uh, Luke 21, where we just read just a few moments ago, that this will result 
and you're being witnesses to them. I, I love how the ESV says it, the translation. It says, it says that this will be your opportunity to bear witness. And so write this down in your notes. Here's three things I'm going to leave you with today. Number one is make the most of every opportunity. That sometimes the most challenging circumstances make for the best opportunities. Take a moment. Watch this video. January 17th, on my 22nd birthday, I was on a ship bound for the Middle East. When Bush declared war, I was in front of the television. I was watching 24-7 to see if there were any Marines killed that day, and if so, where were they from? When they finally got the word that we were going, you just it was so excited because like the fastest way home for us is the way through Baghdad. I finally got to the point where I couldn't watch it anymore. I, I just I couldn't take it anymore. I was really ready for the adventure of being gone, being overseas, but just being in a new marriage, you know, just getting to know my wife, I was kind of worried what how would she go through while I was gone. I think for the first time I'm in my life, I had the hardest time not worrying. During deployment, it was like I was always trying to get Marines to go to Bible studies. A lot of Marines had a lot of problems in life. They dealt with drugs when they were younger or were running away from home for reasons. And they thought, you weren't a real Marine unless you drank a whole bunch. So it was kind of difficult making friends. But then it really changed when the war started because these people were really like, I might not be coming home. They started opening up a lot. It was, it was an awesome thing that God was working in. On the morning of April 8th, they said, you'll be going into Baghdad. They said, we're going to patrol through this town, but we're leaving our armored vehicles behind. Had some local civilians come up to us. They said, oh, there's weapons in the school. So we sent a squad into the school itself, and then um, the rest of us outlined the school, protecting it, make sure so no one would come in and out. We were lined up in the street. I was up against the wall, and all of a sudden, you know, you heard a zip, zip, and then heard a thump. And looked down, and I actually saw my leg bleeding all over the place. We got a phone call, and they said, there's this Corporal Lamb Stutz, his wife. My heart skipped a couple beats, and he said, uh, I just want you to know your husband's all right, but he was shot by an enemy sniper outside of Baghdad. When I flew to um, Houston, it was crazy. I mean, there was cameras all over the place, and I was expecting maybe one or two stations, you know, just to see the person back from the war, but I wasn't prepared for anything like that. It was really incredible how they didn't cut anything about the Lord out and that his faith really shined through and that Christ got all the credit for it. God was definitely looking down on me. Sometimes you think other people have a better life than you, knowing that when I graduated high school, I wasn't going to a, a four-year college and mom and dad didn't have the money to pay for that school. I joined the Marine Corps to serve my country, but also to learn that, earn that money so I could go to school later. And then sometimes I was wondering, you know, why am I in the Marine Corps now and other kids are at college having fun and not having to fight wars? But joining the Marine Corps is an awesome decision. It was a hard time for me, but it built my faith in such a way that I'd never known before. It's just somewhere God needed me and I was able to minister. It was actually more of a, a four-year mission trip for me, going to Washington, D.C., serving with two presidents, being able to free a people from oppression or from a, a dictator, and then being coming home and being getting a, a, a hero's welcome. It was just the opportunities that I've been given by God and this is just beyond my wildest dreams, something that you read about in the book. You know, you, you may be thinking today that I, I could never do something like that, but, but here's my question is that if the Lord asked you to bear witness to his name today and he gave you that opportunity, would you do it? Would you do it? When the cancer strikes, would you bear witness to his name? When you lose the job, would you bear witness to his name? When the struggle comes in your life, would you bear witness to name? At lunch today, which is on many of you, your minds right now, I can just, I can tell. But at lunch today, would you, would you bear witness? Would you bear witness to his name? This chapter finishes out starting in verse 29. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree. And all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happen, you know that the kingdom of God is near. 
I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So put on this screen for us to watch and for us to pray. And we watch and we pray. Now, some scholars say that this passage, Luke 21, is one of the hardest to interpret, one of the hardest to understand in all of the New Testament. And, and there's, there's this, this kind of, re, this, there's this kind of sense that we feel of that sometimes. I mean, Peter talks about it in 2 Peter 3, he talks about, you know, that some of these things that Paul wrote are hard to understand. But the Spirit guides us, and He leads us. And as we're watching and as we're praying, we, we begin to understand those things that God is calling us to in our life, those opportunities that he is placing before us in our own life. We begin to understand those a little more clearly. And so we watch and we pray. And then he closes this chapter out in verse 37 and verse 38 saying this, that each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. So we listen with great expectation. We listen to God with great expectation. The five discourses in the book of Matthew it starts with the Sermon on the Mount and it ends with the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. And the people gathered and they listened. They listen to Jesus. And there's this $2 theological word called eschatology. And it's the study of the end times. And it's a fascinating study sometimes. And to ignore it would be to ignore Scripture. But one thing that I've realized in my own life is that, that Jesus talks about the end but he doesn't major in it. He spends time with people. He focuses on relationships. He's a relational God. And so how are you going to make the most of your opportunity this week? How are you going to make the most of it? How, what do you want to be said of you as you leave your legacy in life? Do you want it to be said that, hey, he or she, they made the least of everything? They made the least of every opportunity. Or do you want to be defined by people that make the most of every opportunity? Let's pray this morning. God, you did not promise us that life would be easy. But you have promised us because of the empty tomb that life would be meaningful that we would be able to find our identity in something greater than ourselves, that our identity is not in our vocation, it's not in our career. Our identity is not in how many children we have or don't have. Our identity is not in our spouse. Our identity is not in our singleness. Our identity is not in our seniorness. Our identity is in Christ. May we be reminded of that today. Because when you know who you are, you know what to do. We thank you for our identity in Christ. Father, I pray that as we leave this place, that we will make the most of every opportunity. God, I pray that we will watch and that we will be mindful and that we will pray. And then that we will listen to your spirit with great expectation. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you be standing this morning? We're going to be singing this song in just a moment. And as we do, there'll be a shepherd down front. There'll also be a shepherd back here in room 113. Uh, if you need some help, 
uh, being prayed over. If you have something going on in your life that one of our shepherds can walk alongside you with, please don't hesitate to use them today. That's what they're here for. Let's sing this song. Come as we sing. I will never be the same again. I can never return. I've lost the